upbringing in real time. Uh, he headed the streaming compute group within Twitter, uh, and he is responsible uh, for the very popular uh, Storm architecture. Um, and so we've invited Nathan Marks to, to speak, and he's not going to speak about Storm today. I think he's going to speak about uh, a more general topic that's really applicable to most of the NoSQL, and it's about the uncertainty in uh, data. So with that, please uh, welcome Nathan Marks. So let's just start off by making the claim that your code is wrong. And really that everyone's code is wrong, including my own. <laughs> so let's start with an example of what I mean by this. And the example I'm going to use is a small feature in Storm called the report error method. Now for those of you that don't know what Storm is, uh, Storm is a real-time computation system. It's like Hadoop, but for real-time problems. In Storm, you run what are called topologies that are infinite computations, whereas in Hadoop, you run jobs which are fixed computations. So to understand this example and some of the later examples I'll be using, it's helpful to understand the very high-level architecture of the Storm cluster. So let me just spend a minute going over this. So there are three classes of nodes in the Storm cluster. On the left here, we have Nimbus, which is the master node, and it plays a role similar to the Hadoop job drive. Nimbus is where you submit topologies for execution, and Nimbus will take care of launching orders around the cluster to run your topology. And Nimbus will monitor your topology, so if a worker dies, it will reassign that worker to another machine. In the middle, there is a Zookeeper cluster. So Zookeeper is not part of Swarm, Zookeeper is an Apache project, but Swarm uses Zookeeper to do cluster coordination, which is pretty much exactly what Zookeeper was built for. And on the right, we have a set of worker nodes. Each worker node runs a daemon called the supervisor. Uh, and the supervisor communicates with Nimbus through Zookeeper to determine what should be running on that machine, and then the supervisor will start and stop workers as necessary as dictated by Nimbus. All right, so that's all you need to know about Storm Plus. So let's get back to the report error method. So the report error method is a function that a developer can use that's provided by Storm uh, that can be used to display errors in Storm UI. And what the Storm UI is, is a central place that a developer can go to to see what's going on with the topology. So you can see things like statistics and metrics, and also errors that are happening in the topology. So by using the report error method, it's a quick and easy way to see what's going on through your computation all across the cluster. <laughs> the way we implemented the report error method is that that error information is stored in Zookeeper. Uh, and the reason we store it in Zookeeper is because it's really the only place we can store state in the storm. Uh, and even though Zookeeper can't handle that much load, this is expected to be safe because errors should be relatively rare. Uh, it turns out there were some serious problems with this, this design. So what would happen when a user deploys code like this? Which, in fact, one of our users at Twitter deployed code almost exactly like this. And what this code does is that for every input tuple, it throws a null pointer exception, and then it catches all of the null pointer exceptions and calls report error on that null pointer exception. And so what happens is that report error is called once for every input tuple. So if you're processing 100,000 tuples per second, you're now calling for error 100,000 times per second, which is a lot. And the effect of this is it causes a denial of service attack in Zookeeper and brings the entire cluster down and kills everyone's apologies. So what went wrong here was a mismatch between how we expected that method to be used and how it was actually used in practice. Or to put it another way, the input space that we designed for was different than the input space we actually saw in production. Now, by input space, I mean more than just the arguments you pass into your functions. I also mean how often do you call these functions and what's the context in which they're used. But that's not exactly what I mean when I say your code is wrong. At least, that's not only what I mean. I also mean your code is literally wrong. The logic itself is incorrect. Now, maybe I'm being presumptuous, because after all, I don't know what your software does. I've never actually seen your code, and I've never even met you. But I'm going to stick to it. Your code is definitely wrong. <laughs> this is just a fact of nature. It's impossible for your code to be completely correct. Now, if you want to persist in saying that your code is correct, then I can reasonably ask you, why do you believe your code is correct? And then you'll probably say something like, well, my code depends on 
dependencies one, two, and three, and it matches them together just the right way to get the properties that might go past. And then I might ask, how do you know dependency one is correct? And then you'll say dependency one depends on dependencies four and five, and it matches them together just the right way to get the properties of dependency one. And then I might ask, how do you know dependency four is correct? Now we can just go on and on like this, and eventually we're going to reach the hardware. Upon which I can reasonably ask, how do you know the hardware is correct? Now at this point, you're probably going to pause for a second, but then you'll say something about how the electronics work. And then I can ask, how do you know the electronics work? electronics are correct. And then you'll say chemistry. And then I'll say, I know chemistry is correct. Atomic physics. I know atomic physics, physics is correct. <laughs> Quantum mechanics. But Richard Feynman said, nobody understands <laughs> quantum mechanics. So how can you say anything conclusive of anything that follows from it? Now maybe you're smarter than Richard Feynman. You understand quantum mechanics. And you understand the whole tree of reasoning. But I wouldn't put my hopes on it. So I think I'm justified in saying your code is wrong. Now I'm being facetious here, but there's an underlying point. What underlies our software is an unbelievable amount of complexity. There's no way anyone can possibly understand all of this. There are mis mistakes, mistakes will be made all over this tree of dependency. But forget all of this theory. Just look at the evidence. Any software you use of even the most minuscule complexity has had bugs in it, including the software you've written. So it's adequate to think that this time you got it right. I think the best you can say is that your code is sometimes correct, maybe even mostly correct. But the thing is, that's actually good enough, because we're not in the business of creating perfect software. We're in the business of providing value for our users. And software does not have to be perfect to provide value. And that's a good thing, because otherwise we'd all be unemployed. But the fact that things don't work perfectly is true of every machine we use, whether it's natural or man-made. Rockets sometimes explode. Our pipes break. Our computers break. Our headphones break. Our bodies break down. Our cars crash. We all know this, and software is no different. So given that your code is wrong, it's wrong to treat your code as deterministic. It may be deterministic in theory, but in practice, you have to treat it as non-deterministic. You have to treat it as probabilistic, as something that might work. And this brings me to the key point that I would make, which is when you embrace that your code is wrong, you can design much better software. And what I mean by better software is it's software that works a higher percentage of the time. It's software that's more robust. It's software where the input space you design for has greater overlap with the actual input space you see in production. So let me give an example of what you can achieve when you embrace the code wrong in terms of building better software. So what I want to talk about is a problem I saw in Hadoop's design and fixed when I was creating Storm. Now Hadoop has gotten better since then, so not everything I'm going to say is still true, but this was certainly the case when I was designing Storm. So the way it works is it has a job tracker that manages all the running jobs and it assigns tasks around the cluster and things like that. And the way the job tracker does this is it keeps a bunch of state in memory about those jobs. Now the problem was that when the job tracker dies, all the jobs will die. And this really sucks when you've been waiting 30 hours for a job to complete. <laughs> now there were all sorts of things that could cause a job tracker to crash. I remember there was one thing that was particularly aggravating, which is when you submitted a job big of a job configuration, the job tracker would have not been used to session and then crash and bring down the entire software. But we've already established that your code is wrong. So it's not reasonable to think that your processes will run forever. They will crash. There is some bug in there that will cause them to crash under certain conditions. So when I was designing Storm, I decided Storm's means would be process fault tolerant. What this means is that a process could die and restart have no effect on running topologies. So if you look at Nimbus, which is Storm's equivalent of Hadoop's job tracker, if you kill it, nothing happens. The topologies just keep on running like nothing happened. And the way this is accomplished is that all state for Nimbus is either kept on disk or in zookeeper. So when Nimbus comes back up, it recovers its state and then resumes where it left off. 
Now, of course, you need to just have to do reassignments and just submit new topologies, but as long as the process is able to restart, then you're totally fine. And what I achieve with this design is that the software just works better. It works for a greater portion of the input space. We're now protecting against stray errors that cause an industry crash, things like race provisions that are unlikely. Now, of course, the software isn't perfect, it's just better, it just works more of the time. I remember this one time we made this mistake and deployed uh, in the internal Twitter software, we deployed a new version of Nimbus that had a blatant no corner exception in it. Literally, Nimbus would start up, it would do a round of reassignments, and then it would hit the no corner exception and crash. And then it would restart, do a round of reassignments, hit a no corner exception and crash. And what's crazy about this is that the cluster was actually working fine. Like the qualities were, 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 were totally okay. And even if the quality had a failure, it would still get reassigned uh, properly. Now, of course, you could submit new topologies because Nimbus wouldn't stay up long enough to accept it, but at least the existing stuff was running perfectly okay. And this was really cool to see because it was seeing the design process fault tolerance really paying off in action. Now, it's an obvious point, but in order to design better software, you have to consider what are all the possible impacts that your code getting wrong. And the bad stuff happens whenever your software sees an input that's not in your design in this space, so on the right side of the diagram. We're talking about things like failures, where your code does the wrong thing or produces the wrong answer. We're talking about things like bad performance or security holes. If you think about it, the entire computer security industry exists because of a mismatch between the actual interest space and the design interest space for the software that you're building. So there are a number of design principles that emerge when you embrace that your code is wrong. So I want to go through a few of these. The first I want to talk about is that measuring and monitoring your software are the foundation of solid engineering. You cannot possibly improve your software without an understanding of the conditions in which it works and in which it doesn't work. So what I mean by measuring is answering the question, under what range of inputs does my software function well? Under what range of inputs do my dependencies function well? Measurement is crucial to understand how to avoid abusing it. And by monitoring, I mean answering the question, what's the actual input space of my software? And both measuring and monitoring are critical to doing good engineering. And personally, I've seen nearly enough of it happening, uh, measuring in particular. Like, you should be doing thorough tests of every dependency you decide to use, especially infrastructure, especially all the NoSQL database that you're using or thinking about using. Like, when you look at other engineering disciplines, like, let's say, an electrical engineer, they measure the hell out of every component they use, every transistor, resistor, capacitor. The functional input range of every component is very carefully measured and understood. What's crazy about software is it's actually way easier to measure and monitor with software, yet we do it much less rigorously. I think part of the engineering process should be listing out every knob that affects your software and seeing what happens when you twist those knobs all the way. And you should be monitoring every possible aspect of your software. We're talking about things like latency, throughputs, stack traces, buffer sizes, memory usage, CPU usage, and a million other metrics that, that you can collect on your software. I would actually say that how you monitor your software is as important as the functionality, because problems in production will happen. You will have downtime. Even Google went down this past week. The only way to quickly diagnose problems in production is by having really, really good monitoring, and that's the key to minimize downtime. Like, think of Apollo 13. Those astronauts were in serious trouble. And one of the reasons that they made it back alive is because they had an amazing telemetry so the engineers on the ground could quickly figure out what was wrong and deploy fixes to get them back home safely. The second design principle I want to talk about is embracing immutability. And immutability is something that's definitely not embraced by the vast majority of applications. When you look at most applications, they look something like this where you have an application that talks to some sort of read-write database, whether that database is MySQL, MongoDB, React, Cassandra, or the million other databases in existence. But as we've established, your code is wrong, so writes you didn't expect are going to happen, and your data will be corrupted. And you may not know why it was corrupted, because you won't detect the corruption until potentially long after it happens. Now these kinds of errors are the worst. They're incredibly hard and incredibly time consuming to debug. I've lost weeks of time just debugging one of these problems. 
Plus, whenever this problem happens, you may have permanently lost user data, which should be completely unacceptable. Now, there's alternative ways to design your data architectures, and that's based upon immutability. Now, the idea we have immutable architecture is that you have uh, as your core data store an immutable, ever growing list of data where the only byte operation is adding a new piece of data. And then you build views on that data that aggregate and index the data so that your application can do queries efficiently. Now, in today's world where storage is cheap, these architectures are very doable and very viable. It's not that expensive to just store all of the data. And one thing you can achieve when your only byte operation is adding new pieces of data is you can add redundant checks to actually make it really difficult for random error to cause problems, to cause corruption. So you can add things like permissions so that updates and deletes are literally not allowed in that master data store. And this gives you a lot of protection from the random errors that you'll see in production. Another benefit of this is that it makes it much easier to debug problems because you always have available the exact inputs for your outputs. If you see there's a problem with your view, you can see the exact inputs that went into producing that, and therefore you can fix it much, much easier. So those of you who are familiar with my work know that this is the basis of the Lambda architecture, which I talked about extensively. Now, of course, there's tons of details to actually implement this, but this is uh, this is the general idea. So the third design principle I'm going to talk about is minimizing the uh, this is actually a little bit more subtle than it looks. But the general idea is that the less that can go wrong, the less that will go wrong with your software. As an, as an example of this, I want to consider one aspect of how Storm uses Zookeeper. So one of the things Storm stores in Zookeeper is the location of all workers in the cluster. So if a worker dies and is reassigned to a new location, that information needs to propagate to the worker because all workers need to know the location of other workers so they know where to send messages. Now, there's two ways a worker might get location updates. The first is by the pulling method, where the idea is that the worker pulls the keeper every few seconds to refresh the location information. This works great, but it adds a few seconds latency into when the uh, location information is available and when the location information is propagated. The second method is to use a feature in Zookeeper called watches, so that as soon as the information is updated in Zookeeper, that information is pushed and immediately propagates all. Now, of course, method two is much faster, but it adds a reliance, it adds a dependency on another feature of Zookeeper. So what I decided in Storm's design is that Storm uses both methods. So it uses the watch feature, but it also pulls every few seconds just in case the watch feature doesn't work. Now, this turned out to be a far-sighted decision because it turns out watch had a bug in them that would have affected Storm, but it did not affect Storm because Storm had this redundancy in it. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have any dependency that you should be re-implementing everything you're using. That's obviously ridiculous. Everything's a trade-off. In this case, the limiting to the dependency was justified because of the very small amount of code required. We're literally just talking about 10 lines of code to reduce or to remove the dependency on that feed. The next design principle I want to talk about is explicitly respecting the functional input ranges of your components. So let's come back to that report where error method that I talked about. So the problem with this method is that if you could by calling it too often, which would cause Zookeeper to be overloaded, and that this would then bring down the cluster. And so where the way we solve the problem is we have the method throttle itself to avoid the overload of Zookeeper. So any errors reported over the throttle rate would be logged locally, but not written to Zookeeper. And this causes report error to work for a greater portion of the input space. It now no longer fails when it's called too often. And you see a similar pattern happen whenever you're dealing with log files. It's really important that your log files automatically trim themselves, or else run into situations where you can run out of disk space. But the more general principle is that you can use self-throttling to respect the functional information that the components are using to prevent cascading failures. Because the only thing worse than something failing because it's wrong is something failing because something completely unrelated is wrong. Cascading failures are surprisingly common and it's really important to prevent them. The last design principle I'm going to talk about is embracing recomputation. So when I said your code is wrong, um, there were multiple meanings to that phrase. The first was that your design input space differs from your actual input space. The second was that the logic of your code is literally wrong. And the last meaning I want to talk about is that the requirements for your software are constantly changing. So the code of today is wrong for the requirements of tomorrow. Now, 
Dynamic computation is a technique that helps with all of these definitions we just focused on. So let me start with the last one. So obviously, you need to be able to change your code to match the shipping requirements of the software. So the problem is that's not all you have to do. You may have to do a big migration of your existing data to make that new code work. So for example, let's say you're working on building blogging software. And then suddenly you have a new requirement that you've never dealt with before, which is that you need to be able to search on all, all articles on, on the blog. So of course, you need to build a search index on all your data. Now building a search index is much easier when you can easily run a computation on, on all your data and build it from scratch. Now fortunately, in today's world, this is actually pretty easy. We have tools like Hadoop, which are very good at running functions on all your data. So you can use Hadoop to build a partition search index in a massive batch job and prepare your, your, your deployment for your new code. But reading computation can do so much more than just, uh, just adapting to new requirements. And it works especially well in conjunction with immutability. Right? If we consider the immutable architecture again, and now we consider what are some of the mistakes that can happen. Recomputation can help with a lot of those mistakes. Let's say you write some bad corrupt data. So some of you start writing bad data for your usual data store. And this will then corrupt your views because then the, that bad data propagates. So what you can do is remove the bad data or add code to ignore it and then recompute your views from scratch and then everything is back to normal. Yeah. Or if your code, if the code for actually generating, generating your views is wrong, you can just fix the code, recompute the views, and again, everything is back to normal. Um, Recomputation adds a lot of robustness to your data architectures, and I personally would question the robustness of any data architecture that's unable to easily do recomputation. Now, I've gone through a number of design principles that result from your code being wrong. And the pattern that I hope has emerged is that software engineering is really no different than any other engineering. The underlying challenges are the same, at least when it comes to what it takes to get what you're making work better. Like consider engineering a bridge. A bridge is dependent on the steel and the wires that comprise it. And even though it's a static structure, it has a lot of inputs. Its inputs are things like wind, rain, snow, the varying weights of the vehicle's crossing, the occasional earthquake. Now there's always some magnitude of earthquake for which the bridge will fail. And it's the job of the engineer to make sure the bridge works under the appropriate input space. Or consider a jet engine. A jet engine will work fine in normal or even stormy weather. Now, it's not going to work too well in a hurricane or if a flock of birds flies through it. But that's fine. That's an acceptable functional input range. Engineering is about balancing your functional input range and it's not just going to cost to increase that input range. And the question you ask in all engineering, whether physical or software, is the same. What's going to break what I'm making? What are the limits of my dependencies? How much stress can this piece of metal handle? How much load can this database take? How can I add redundancy to increase robustness? Right? Like, a bridge is redundant. If you chip a small piece of metal off a bridge, it's not going to collapse. Likewise, process fault tolerance is an example of adding redundancy to software to make it work better, to make it more robust. How can I isolate failures so they don't bring down the entire system? Like, all these questions can be asked as it relates to the bridge as it can, as it can be asked of Cassandra or React or Hadoop or Storm. And the only difference in software is that our raw materials are ideas Uh, 
And so let's say if it is on the watch side in the zookeeper, it need to keep keep your registry and keep on looking for the changes to update. So instead, if there is a asynchronous communication between the zookeeper and the tenant node, it would be a lightweight architecture, isn't it? Hey Nathan, uh, quick question. I, I use Storm and I think it's a great product, but my question is what was the imperative to reinvent the wheel? Why didn't you just fork a do and add the changes that you needed there? Um, well, what Storm does is fundamentally different than to do. Um, like to do is about running large space back batch computations and Storm's about running. The only things I really would have wanted to reuse from Hadoop are like task management and resource management, which I felt that Hadoop didn't do well. For example, uh, the process wall tolerance thing I brought up. Um, and so it was better to uh, re implement it. So, like, when we talk about real time computation, your requirements are fundamentally different. Like, one of the things I've talked about in my other talks is how um, the fact that Hadoop that, that has these problems where, like, Hadoop had early, you know, back when I was using it, had a lot of problems, a lot of robustness problems, where it would crack and go down and your job won't work. Um, but this actually isn't that big of a deal for to do, at least when it comes to its requirements, because it's a batch computation system, which means it's a high latency system. So if something goes wrong, then that adds latency to an already high latency system, and that's not that big of a deal. In a system like Storm, if you add latency to a real-time system, you're no longer meeting your requirements in real time. So your robustness requirements are much, much so therefore, the way you design your software uh, needs to be much more rigorous, which is certainly what I did with Storm. On your right. So uh, I've been using Storm and a big fan of Storm. And my question is that where do you see the future of Storm, especially with cloud? Uh, one, one issue I see is that uh, we want to scale up uh, in a cloud environment and be able to scale down as well, depending upon need. But the topology in Storm is static in that sense that you just can't add more nodes to a running cluster. So do you see that that's something that uh, would be uh, improved in Storm, in Storm going forward? Uh, well, first of all, you can't add nodes to a running cluster. Uh, it's just, there's limitations on how you change the power of the running cluster. Um, now, Storm has ways to deal with that. You can, you can take the problem to deploy new versions of the topology. So you mentioned um, the Hadoop Child Tracker as an influence in some of these design principles. Were there any other projects that you can point to as big design influences for Storm? Uh, good question. I think it's probably, from a philosophical level, Clojure. So Clojure is a uh, functional list-based program language for JVM. Storm's actually written in Clojure, uh, but Clojure embraces especially immutability. Um, and I guess more generally, Clojure embraces this philosophy of simplicity. Um, the work I the, the creator of Clojure is this guy, Rich Hickey, and the work that he's been doing is absolutely brilliant. Um, I highly recommend watching his talks. Um, certainly, his philosophy is definitely influenced Storm as well as all the software. Okay. We're 
out of time, but uh, thank you very much, Nathan. Let's uh, give him a round of thanks. So we'll get back to 10.15. Um, uh, coffee served outside. I'd like to thank uh, all of our morning speakers uh, for getting, off this, getting us off to great start. We'll uh, see you at the next few hours. Thank you.